So, you know, at the time, they were just starting to sort of come off the boil. Um, you know, they were looking for other avenues to sort of grow sales, and we sort of started with those. And, you know, when you start with those two, then the next one comes in, the next one comes in. So it really has been that journey over a period of time. Uh, you know, the other way of asking that is, you know, five years ago, would I have thought River Island would be selling on No. But actually, um, you know, they came to us. And in a very kind of forward-thinking brand, you know, they saw it as the opportunity. And you know, they were ahead of the game. And, but actually now, rolling it forward, you know, I, I think the world of retail has fundamentally changed. You know, yes, you can have your stores. Yes, you can have your own website. But actually, why wouldn't you also want to be in or on ASOS? You know, ASOS is effectively just a Westfield, but just online. You know, it's pretty logical. And actually, the logic, the, the, the logic of that has, has always been around. You know, we're just a department store. Bottles always where you have a house brand. You put your brand in front of where, you know, where your customers are going. So, so even though it's a bit alien at the time, actually, it's pretty logical now. Um, questions are very much in the middle. Uh, yeah, it's in the front. She said, can I you know, do baby bread? And we went, well, rather than you go, come and do baby bread. So she started doing baby bread. Six months into that journey, I'm having battles because I don't want to put a baby on my own page. I don't want to put a baby in a magazine. You know, we built this fashion thing that was aimed at 22-year-old girl, and you don't want to see babies. You want to see what you're going to wear on Friday night. So straight away, you had this sort of angst in the business, and we just... Ironically, it was doing sort of okay. We actually got Gap Kids on there, which you know, at the time was like, wow. And then we went, you know what, it's killing us, because we had all this kind of confusion in the business. And we also did it on the luxury side. So we started getting more expensive brands onto the website. You know, we were selling 500 quid dresses and stuff. And our lovely girls in marketing would look at the 500 pound dress. Okay, they earn a bit more money than your average person, so they might just be able to afford one of those a year. But they thought the dress was amazing. So they put the 500 pound dress on the email, or they put the 500 pound dress on the front cover of the magazine. So now we'd have a 500 pound dress going to 8 million 21 year olds, neither, none of which have got 500 pounds to spend on the dress. And again, the whole thing was getting out of kilter. So actually, it was like, right, stop. We do fashion for a 21 year old. They have a, 21 year old has 100 pounds a month to spend on fashion. <coughs> That's what we do, and cuts out all the rest of it. And actually, that was a kind of, you know, it was a reinvigorating moment for the business, but also it just makes it so clear. I mean, there isn't a single person at ASOS who doesn't know that our customer is 27. We only ever talk about 27. And it just makes it really clear. So, simplicity is. Really, really good question. And, you know, it, it's the bit that scares me um, because I, you, know, you, you can't be in every meeting. You can't be with them. So, so you've got to have really simple messages. You know, our target is 20 something. So you always got to oversimplify. Um, you know, we probably made a bit of a, a mistake internationally. We sort of, um, you know, as we started to nationalise, we employed some quite big people. They started setting up, um, you know, fairly big overseas divisions, you know, with big divisions, come from more people, you know, they're, they're trying to create their own kind of cultural brand, you know, and suddenly they're doing stuff with the ASOS brand that I don't want to be doing, you know, and suddenly you can see the whole thing kind of gets out of kilter, so actually you've got to, you've got to oversimplify, and you think about the big global brands, it could be, you know, FMCG brands or fashion brand, you know, everything is really simple, you know, that Zara store is the same the world over, and H an ad for H&M is the same the world over. You know, and Africa Coke is pretty much the same, the world over. So actually, as you get bigger and more international, it's, it's by having really simple, clear-cut guidelines with regard to the brand, and then hopefully 
with that comes sort of more simple way of doing business. And if we can keep everything simple, that's the kind of entrepreneurial way. And you know, get, getting people. So we, we've never had one of these, and I sort of kick myself a bit because you hear about you know these companies who who have a culture whereby you know if you're going to say no to something, you have to justify that in three pages of a form. You know, which I actually kind of quite like because it gets people to say yes to things. You know, we haven't got one of those sort of little mantras. But it, it is, you know, keeping that culture of, you know, just saying yes to stuff. And going back to the, the business thing, if you keep moving and keep flexible, that's hopefully more secure. So one question from this plan, someone? Or maybe not. Um, in their quality of a dinner jacket. So. How would you say the male pattern industry has changed since you said everybody started? Well, I, I think our male... Well, let, let's go back to what was. Like Pre-internet, you know, your fashion buying universe was pretty much the two or three stores that you had in your local area. And if you were lucky to, you know, have a big out of town shopping place or close enough to London to come to Oxford Street, you, you'd get more of it. But actually, you know, most of us grew up in places where the, the fashion offer, should we say, was pretty sparse, pretty limited. But then, oh my God, it was like almost non-existent. So I think, I think structurally, men have been disadvantaged in the world of fashion for years. And I actually now think, blimey, the opportunity, sorry, the, the, the kind of, the, the, the internet has, has now enabled men to enjoy fashion, uh, you know, just with sheer availability more than, more than anything else. So I actually think, um, you know, an old you know, metrosexual or whatever, you know, I, I think men are, are going to be as fashionable than our female counterparts. That, that's the big trend. So historically, fashion business has been a kind of 70-30 split. Now I think, you know, why couldn't it be 50-50? I think men are buying fashion for occasions now, which they never used to do before. You know, men, men would normally shop three times a year in one big bundle. Now, you know, men are buying fashion. And things like ASOS are enabling them to, to buy fashion uh, in a much more kind of inspired way. But also think about men's magazines. All of the circulations are tiny. You add up the Scar, GQ, FHM, you know, probably no more than a million circulation in its entirety. So actually, you know, now look at look at the inspiration that Michael Baseball can give the mail. So so at the moment I think it's about thirty seven percent of our business, but I mean it could easily be fifty percent if it if we get it right. Check it. So it is just a mind trip. 
the logic. Of course, we all don't want to have to return stuff. You know, so it's a, it's a bad experience, and b, it's a pain. You know, but unfortunately, there are so many facets of play. Uh, it starts with actually, you just don't want to see yourself <laughs> or your body shape. <laughs> um, you know, neither of you could do it. They're getting it right. So I'm afraid for now, free libre, free returns is the kind of is the closest free libre we're going to get to. That. I'm sure somebody will come here at some point. But, okay. We have the last like five or so minutes. I think maybe two or three more questions, and then and then we'll uh, wrap up. So I think that's really, I know it's an obvious question, but actually it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting one. If you take the journey, you know, 10 years ago, we generally thought we would have to have thought. And actually, nobody knows this, but as seen on screen, had a concession in Top Shop in Oxford Circle. <laughs> we were actually like a couple of rails there as a, as a little trial to, to that. Um, then it was sort of blinding, this internet thing seems to be taking off. Um, have we got time to get our heads around stores as well? No. And actually, you know, we just kind of kept rolling that. So it went sort of from, yes, we're going to have to, to, blimey, we might, but we haven't got the time. So then we kind of, about four years ago, kind of got to a point where, do you know what? What if we had, like, you know, the corner of Oxford Circus as the flagship, you know, the corner of some place in Beijing as the flagship, somewhere on Fifth Avenue as the flagship, you know, could you see that? And, you know, I could I almost convince myself, yeah, I could I'd see that. And then I thought, do you know what? I'm entering a world of physical retail, which I know even less about than I do about online retail. I thought, why would I want to put myself in a space where I'm going to compete against people that have done that for so on? So then it got a, oh, no, I don't want to do that. You don't want to compete in the, in the kind of physical world. Now it's got to a, and these are the figures I hear. I hear that some 20-year-olds are spending 80% of their fashion purse online. Okay, who's spending who's spending more than fifty percent of their fashion online? <laughs> so that that's come from zero to that in the last ten years, and and actually I think that's not as much as it could be because we still make it quite hard. Sizing, delivery, you know, all these kind of little barriers in the way. All every year those barriers get stripped out. I mean, if you've got if you're a premier customer, you get the alley. You get the name of the driver, you get the hand delivery slot, you can track it to the door, I mean, you know, now you get the collect class, you can go to get, so all, every year we're making it easier for you to do that. Every year I think that number's going to get bigger. So the thought now of going through the is just totally counterintuitive to, to the way the market is going. So our uh, second last question, a gentleman in the chat chat, you See, you spoke about how you would rather stick to young fashion as opposed to grow old with your customers. Wouldn't you say there's a much higher cost of customer acquisition because of that? And wouldn't the company have to keep evolving with the customer? Um, well, if I, if I go back to the 97, 98% of 20 somethings, you know, live outside of the UK, and and I've got less than 1%, or probably less than 0.2% of the global 20 something signed up as company. You know, and the opportunity for just 20 somethings is still enormous and actually go back to the point earlier you know a wise man once said you know you can always put cigarettes at the till you know you can always make a few extra quid but actually you know being true to what you do is a far more enduring way I mean I've never always been in WA Smiths really but you know actually by the time you've been through the maze to get to the till past 500 bars of chocolate you know <laughs> that whole kind of retail experience is kind of lost on me a bit now you know, you can always make an extra quid, but actually for the long-term endurance of a business, you're better off doing something tighter and doing it better rather than trying to do other things. Simplicity. And the very last question, uh, Lady in the glasses. Uh, I was just wondering why there aren't products on the website. Well, there aren't. There aren't. Um, because it comes and goes so quickly. Um, and I think from, a, from an experience point of view, if you, when I've looked at websites that have reviews, there's so few, so few of the products actually have a review, I think it's a disappointing experience. Um, you know, and it's fashion, your opinion is gonna to be totally different to the girl next door, who's totally different to the girl next door. It's, you know, with a camera, I get it. You know, the camera's simple and it, it's got basic functionality, everyone's gonna get it. In the world of fashion, it's so opinionated. But some issue is everybody's opinion is totally different, and 
B, it's a poor experience when there just aren't enough reviews there. I think that's a detractor away from it. Would you like us to do it? You would. Would you, would you fill in reviews on that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, quick vote. Who would like us to do reviews on our product? Put it back on the media. Let's have a look at it. Thank you for that. Okay, I think we have one question from our committee actually, which is obviously our very last one from Are you considering drone I, I went to a dinner where um, I thought he was giving something back, and, and a lot of the ex military guys now, um, uh, you know, it used to be they did their tour of duty, you know, and then they got a job in the city or in insurance, and you know, they were all taken care of. Unfortunately, those jobs don't exist. Anymore. So we've got a lot of our ex-military guys who come out of the services and you know, are having to get into the real world and find jobs outside of their comfort zone. So, so I went to kind of tell lots of ex-military people about retail because they wouldn't probably normally consider that as a career. Weirdly, I happened to sit next to a drone flyer <laughs> who thought he wanted to set up his own business with these commercial drones. He's not talking about bad ones, he's talking about little ones. Uh, in the commodity space, yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, and he was setting up a business where he works in the commodity industry, so like oil and gas and checking pipelines and gas back and all that kind of stuff. And I went, oh, this sounds good. I'll have a bit of that. So I invested in, in his business. Actually, he's doing really well. So when I read that article about drones, I thought, my God, I'm a genius. I've got, I've got a drones business as well as a. So, uh, <laughs> Actually, I don't really see it taking it off. You know, I see it for oil and gas, yeah, not, not home delivery. Unless you live in the outback. Okay, on that very interesting note, I think it's time to wrap up. Big thank you. 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 Hey guys, just one second of your time. Uh, as you came in, you would have received the Fly the Venture Capitalist Challenge. Uh, this is the final week for application, so you might see it a few times around campus. It's the main program for supporting entrepreneurship and venture creation at Imperial. If you want to find out more, go to imperialcreatelab.com or slash BTC. Then prize and so on. I'll leave it for these guys right there now. Um, and also we gave out um, flies for Steve. Um, what's, what's, uh, what I want to highlight on that, Steve, is the event will go live tomorrow. Um, it's a networking event at the Startup Accelerator with LSC and UTL Entrepreneurs. Um, and there are only 40 places. It's free, but there are only 40 places. Um, so the event will go live um, at Steve's event.